Hi, I'm Barry Mitchell. Welcome once again to Simply Science. Today we're at the American Museum of Natural History, and I'm really excited because I'm going to meet a celebrity. Oh, here comes Talia. She works at the museum. Hi. Hi. So uh, when do I get to meet The Rock? Oh, that's Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. Yeah. Behind you, we have rocks that show landforms throughout time. Next time, Barry. Oh, that's good, too. Well, we've got a rocking show for you. Stick with us. Up first, we have a story about farms. When you think of farms, you probably think of tractors and corn and old McDonald. Well, how about a farm that has a basement, micro celery, and LED lights? Here's Andrew Falzone. It's an idea that sounds outright crazy, putting up a farm in one of Manhattan's most expensive zip codes. But this ain't your granddaddy's farm, and it doesn't look a thing like this. This farm is indoors in a small room in a basement of a downtown building and it represents the future of farming here and now. It's called Farm One. So you can put a vertical farm almost anywhere, but we decided to come to actually one of the most expensive zip codes in Manhattan, Tribeca, uh, because you know a lot of our restaurant customers are very close by, so we can just pop on the subway or even walk to them to do our deliveries. So this central location is actually great for us. Vertical farms get their name from the rows of plants stacked vertically. The controlled environment allows for lots of fine tuning of the grow process, and because so many of Farm One's customers are high-end chefs serving the city's most ornate plates, Farm One produces produce you would consider a delicacy. So you might have heard of a few other vertical farms in New York City and New Jersey now. What makes us really unique is the range of crops that we're growing. So we grow specialty produce for chefs. We grow hard to find items that they might otherwise have to ship in from California or Texas or even Israel. We'll grow these varieties indoors and we'll grow flowers, we grow rare herbs and even little microgreens that are delicate little plants. And chefs go crazy for this stuff because they're all in New York City competitive and trying to show customers a different taste. That's what makes us special. Some of Farm One's crops are so rare they only grow in the wild, and reproducing those growing conditions is a huge scientific challenge, and part of the team figuring it all out is Kate Ludvikov, Farm One's engineering manager, who says it all starts with hydroponics. Hydroponics is an engineered way of cultivating plants using a soilless growing media and an optimized nutrient solution. And that nutrient solution is part of the tightly controlled grow process that allows Farm One to precisely control nutrient ratios and create proprietary growing recipes, taking the idea of organic to a whole new level. These EC probes, um, EC stands for electrical conductivity. So it's essentially measuring the concentration of nutrients that are in your reservoirs. But water isn't the only ingredient in the mix. Another key component to growing produce indoors is light. So in order to grow all these different crops, we have to use a bunch of new technologies. And one of the most important are these LED lights. So all around me, you'll see slightly different colors of lights. And these lights are specifically made for horticulture. And what they'll produce is LEDs that very closely match sunlight. And so that specifically that spectrum of sunlight that plants will use for photosynthesis. Uh, and the LED lights now that we use, you know, they're very new, they're very efficient. You can even reach out and touch them and they're not hot to the touch, which shows that they're converting all that energy into light. We have the lights on for about 18 hours a day. Um, and that gives the plants a sort of perfect summer's day every day. And while it may all seem like a perfect science, Rob says it's actually a lot of trial and error. But with each successful harvest, Farm One learns exactly how to improve the process. And you know maybe 50% of it doesn't work, but 50% does, and then we'll refine on that. And so you'll find that we're developing a lot of what we call growing recipes, which means that you know if we plant this crop today, we know exactly how long it's going to take, and we we can sort of define a lot of the methods for that, so that 
we can have this really reliable way of growing every time we grow things. And because of all the time and research that goes into the growth recipes, they remain a closely guarded secret. But the farm itself is open to the public, mostly for tasting tours. But you can't just walk right in. You have to put on medical grade shoe booties and a lab coat. This hairnet is the last step in suiting up and I am ready to go. And then it was time to taste some plants with Rob. What I want to give you right now is, is one of my favorites. This is called Nepatella, um, and it's a plant you'll find in Tuscany in Italy. Uh, and chefs there will use it for a bunch of different things, but one of the, the strong things you'll notice is an aroma and a taste of mint, which is that menthol in there. So give that a taste, and you'll notice these are tiny little flowers. I mean, they're less than the size of my little pinky nail, mm -hmm. um, but you'll get a strong flavor from that. Wow, and there's a dissociation because I'm tasting mint, but I'm expecting, you know, like a mint leaf, and it's, right. it's not. It's yeah. this gorgeous little flower. So for a chef, when they get that, uh, how do they use it? Yeah, I mean, this little guy, they can use it in a bunch of ways. I've seen it on a, a dessert, for instance, an ice cream dish even. Um, and actually at 11 Madison Park, who we work with sometimes, uh, they've served this in a very delicate way in a, a, a string, a, a line of these things on a foie gras dish. So uh, very inventive. So there's many, many ways you can use this kind of thing. Not every plant we tasted was as exotic as Nepotella. We were surprised to learn that marigolds are edible plants. So when visitors come to the farm, the reaction is always, whoa, this is pretty amazing to come down into a basement in Manhattan and discover hundreds of varieties growing at one time. So the next time you think about a farm, think less open fields and more great indoors. I'm Andrew Falzone for Simply Science on CUNY TV. When I was a student, a field trip meant tuna fish sandwiches and a day at the museum. Fun. Nowadays, students are going on ocean expeditions and tropical excursions. Here are two trips, and you don't need a parental consent slip to come with us. The first one is a professor who takes his students on a trip to the Gulf of Mexico in search of rare black coral. I'm Eliza Gonzalez, and I'm an undergraduate, and I'm also representing City University of New York, and my college is New York City College of Technology. And I just recently joined Dr. Brugler's lab to study black corals. In late August 2019, uh, two undergraduates from New York City College of Technology and I boarded the research vessel Manta in the northwest Gulf of Mexico and went out to the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. I think the most striking part of this trip was just the fact that I was in the middle of the ocean. Just the trip overall, I was so grateful to be a part of it. You know, I learned so much. We spent uh, roughly five days at sea, and we deployed the remotely operated vehicle Yogi to go down to mesophotic depths, which are between 30 and 150 meters. You start to go underwater, and then you see how much life and how vibrant it is under there, and you're like, wow, you know, this is truly amazing. So it's simply going to take out I run a deep sea evolutionary biology lab here at the American Museum of Natural History with the goal of increasing diversity of the students. Our focal organism are black corals, which is largely a deep water group. And uh, some of these organisms have been aged over 4,000 years old. We start off by teaching them general lab techniques, how to identify these, these deep sea organisms, how to extract their genetic blueprint and sequence it. But, but it doesn't stop there. Um, so they do get that general lab experience, but then I need them to get the real experience, and that's when we send them out to the ocean. We have a black coral behind us. This appears to be a Tanacetopathes. It is, it is a black coral, and, and black corals are so-called because the skeleton is black. The tissue on top of it, the living tissue, can be any, any number of colors. Well, we bought telepresence onto this trip. It was being live over the internet, so it gave an opportunity for everyone and anyone to participate, and it was the first time done in a marine sanctuary. We are in Elvers Bank. And again, this is one of the banks under consideration for the expansion of the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. We are actually looking to look at different species of black corals that, you know, they, that we can find, but we're keeping just an extra eye out for a specific species, um, and that is 
I'm sorry. Help me with the name. Uh, we, you know, it's just we've seen so many. Starts with a P. Oh, um. And ends in pathies. <laughs> Pluma pathies. There you go. Craig and Eliza filled a very, very important role. Everything that we were seeing, Eliza and Craig were on the headset telling the world what the general public was seeing. Black corals are very, very interesting animals. Even though they appear to be uh, plant-like, they feed on organic matter, unlike uh, plants. We are also responsible for obtaining, securing, and preserving samples throughout the trip. When we first get samples to the lab, we essentially extract their DNA. Our goal is to sequence it and to see if we did find a new species. At one point in the cruise, we came across something that we weren't too sure what it was. It actually looked exactly like Welch's fruit snacks, like the purple ones. And um, when we got to take a closer look, it was in fact a sea anemone. This is in fact a new species that we did find. The deep sea, which is defined as any depth between 200 and 11,000 meters, makes up 65% of the Earth's surface, so it's the largest environment on Earth. To date, we've only explored 5% of that. I definitely know research is something that's in my future, definitely. I know I'm going to pursue that and, um, yeah, just see where the research takes me. <laughs> I would love to help train the next generations of, generation of uh, scientists, then I might inspire other children who didn't know that it was a possibility to, to become a scientist to actually do so. Now, from exploring the deep sea to jungle expeditions, here's Donna Hanover. For the past five years, small groups of Gutman College students have gone to Ecuador in the summer and even lived in the jungle. Their leader, Gutman Science Lecturer Derek Tesser. The trip is full of adventures and new experiences, from hiking in the jungle at night, to walking in rain boots through mud up to your knees, to just living in the rainforest, bathing in rivers, and handling species that you've never encountered before in your life. The trip is part of a program known as Global Gutman, and the students rave about it. Jenabu Berry says she was thrilled to get back to the kind of nature she knew as a child in West Africa, Guinea. And the physical training before the trip was vital. Two days every week, we do physical training, we, we do lifting, we do like hike to make sure our legs are prepared. It really, really shaped me and got me ready. Giorbi Suero says hiking into the rainforest was awesome. You have to pass this bridge across a huge river and Right after, you could see the entirety of the jungle like in front of you because like it was kind of like elevated. It was just otherworldly. In the jungle, the students sleep in tents in a large open air hut that is their classroom during the day. And there's a stream out back for cooling off. How about discomfort or fear of creatures? I think our excitement numbed all the pain we got from the, the bucks things. and. <laughs> Honestly, when we saw the endangered snakes and also the spider monkeys, the brown-headed spider monkey, we, we got goosebumps because there's only about a thousand of them left in the wild. And the Itapoa Reserve has about, I believe, like 200 of them. Tesser says conservation biologists help the students stay safe. We don't send students out to go catch the species or catch the snakes with their hands. They're never going to be handling them that way. We have the students only handling the species once they're safely caught and under the supervision of the biologists and the scientists that are working with them. And they definitely get close to animals they'd never encounter back home in New York. One of the most unique things that we see down there are an animal called glass frogs. There are actually many species of them transparent. You can see through their skin, you can see their hearts beating, you can see their stomach when you flip them over and look at them. These are a really unique species that don't exist anywhere else on the planet. But I looked at it, I touched it, but I never hold it on my, like, my hands, but it's really beautiful. And then there are the night hikes. We take night hikes through the jungle at night to find some of these species. We will catch them, we bring them back to the house, and we do photography to raise awareness about some of these really unique species that only exist in this region. It's not the same as the day. You see pure, you see these animals coming out. You see um, the lights, the light you use, you utilize. Um, it's amazing how the view looks during night. There was um, tarantulas in the, in the night hikes. 
they're like, oh, you see the glowing dots there? Those are spider eyes. <laughs> and, and we were like, oh, we, we had to stay away from those. And <laughs> the night hikes were kind of exhausting because we were already hiking throughout the day. So it was, it was like your choice if you wanted to go to them, but we went to them anyway, because we were just like so like pumped, like, yes, we're finally here. It was surreal. Most students come home committed to saving the rainforest as scientists, lawyers, or activists. I'm not sure if the motivation for many students going into it is science or the idea that they can just travel and explore something new, but certainly there's a transformation that happens on the trip. I'm Donna Hanover for Simply Science. It's winter, so that means flu season. We checked in with Dr. Michelle Lin of Mount Sinai Hospital to learn more about this awful seasonal bug. <coughs> The flu is caused by the influenza virus. It's a contagious illness that circulates every year, typically in the winter, because influenza virus happens to reproduce really well when the temperature outside is colder. Also, that happens to coincide uh, with the cold weather, which can lower some people's immune responses. In general, flu is really characterized by high fevers and severe body aches. People often describe it as feeling like they got beat up and the generalized severe fatigue. You can get the sniffles with the flu, but the difference would be with a cold, you almost definitely get a lot of sniffles and upper respiratory congestion, um, and maybe a little bit less fever, maybe a little bit less body aches. So people who are vulnerable to the flu are those who have lowered immune responses for any reason. Um, so we say people over age 65, infants and young children, um, especially those who are not able to be vaccinated because they're too young. Anyone with any type of disease that would cause their immune system to be a little bit less responsive. So people with, you know, certain types of cancer, HIV, um, other chronic illnesses like autoimmune disease. The flu virus is spread via droplets, so anytime you're coughing um, or your saliva gets on materials, um, the virus is actually in that uh, liquid and can get transmitted. And so we recommend, again, washing your hands often, limiting sharing of food and beverages, staying home from work when you are ill, and definitely if you have a fever, you're quite contagious. Um, we actually think people are the most contagious uh, that first 24 to 48 hours before they have symptoms. Uh, so just being really extra careful um, when you're starting to feel a little under the weather. We obviously recommend to everyone that they treat their symptoms, so that's copious hydration, drinking lots of water, um, resting, staying home from work, and then taking over-the-counter medications to help with those body aches and fevers. And then there is an antiviral treatment that is effective in reducing symptom duration up to 12 hours. So if you were to have the flu for, you know, six and a half days, it would make your illness six days. Um, it does need to be started within 72 hours in order to be effective, and it does have some side effects. It is definitely not too late to get the vaccine. Flu season hits its peak typically in late January and February, and it can be active as late as April. So if you've not gotten your vaccine this year, please get it. It is not too late. You can get it almost at any convenience store or clinic. Um, you know, it does take up to two weeks depending on how strong your immune response is. Uh, so the sooner you get it, the better. We have five senses. What happens when they start doing each other's jobs? Can you taste numbers? Does hearing the word Wednesday always make you see the color magenta? You, my friend, have the neurological condition known as synesthesia. I understand you say you get a sense of a color from a person. Yeah. What color am I? You're yellow. Am I yellow because of my sunny personality or what? Let's go with that. Let's go with that. <laughs> <laughs> Natalie Gersberger, she likes to be called Nat, is an artist. Nat has many clients, and like from 1 to 4% of the population, she has synesthesia. I see numbers as colors, but it's not a direct visual in front of me. You know, it's more of a feeling colors or hearing colors. Synesthesia is a condition in which individuals have essentially a mis mixing of the senses. Um, they may see colors, for example, when they see just black letters or numbers. Um, they may hear sounds to flashes of lights. It's essentially any combination of mixes of senses. Like hearing color, tasting words, or even smelling food with your fingertips.
Dr. Rowe and his team conduct brain research here at the City University of New York Graduate Center. We're going to test you on a very, a, one of the most common forms of synesthesia, which is called grapheme color, where people associate numbers or letters with specific colors. Letters have no personality for me. It's just a letter. It's a symbol. It doesn't look like you have grapheme color synesthesia. Hmm. I have other good qualities, though. Definitely. Okay. The neural mechanisms that produce synesthesia are not thoroughly understood, although there have been plenty of studies now that seem to suggest that there is some sort of cross-wiring in the brain that produces it. Okay, quick quiz. How many items are you perceiving right now? Wrong. You're not actually just seeing a red rolling ball, you're actually seeing three things. You're seeing color, um, motion, and the shape of the ball. And so your brain integrates all of those features into one unified percept, even though they're processed in three different parts of the brain. A synesthete, um, depending on the type of synesthesia, might add a fourth element to that. For example, they might um, taste the color of the ball if they have um, color tasting synesthesia. There were instances like when I found out that I had synesthesia about numbers on a blackboard where I just remember being kind of laughed at um, for, you know, saying that numbers are certain colors and, and the teacher was writing it wrong. I always thought that was common until that point that I realized it wasn't, but my mother and my sister have the same thing, so my mom was able to explain it pretty well right away. We have a real opportunity to examine how the brain processes sensory information and um, also allow us to maybe come up with ways in which we can rehabilitate those who may have sensory loss, say after stroke or brain damage. So it is a, a very unique opportunity for us to get a better, deeper understanding of human brain function. Want a free test? Come to the CUNY Graduate Center. If you believe you're a synesthete, do contact us at rowlab at gc.cuny.edu. Dr. Rowe, is it possible for someone to smell music? Oh, yes, absolutely. We've heard your singing. It stinks. The Hayden Planetarium has a new show, Worlds Beyond Earth, that celebrates our home planet and our solar system. Here's Adam Miller with a first look. Well, the story that we hope people walk away with um, is a new appreciation and realization about the specialness of our own planet. At the Hayden Planetarium, a new show called Worlds Beyond Earth takes viewers on a journey through space and shows us the surprisingly dynamic nature of the worlds that orbit our sun and the unique conditions that make life on Earth possible. The specialness of Earth becomes apparent during the exploration of the rest of the solar system. And then we learn more about the Earth by understanding these other bodies. The show uses data from over 60 years of space exploration, from Sputnik, the Apollo missions, and the satellites, telescopes, radars, and rovers of space explorations past and present, and transforms all of that information into truly stellar images. Oftentimes these scientists will visualize their data in order to study it and communicate it, but they'll be very rough approximations. They'll, they might be black and white, they might even be graphs and charts. Um, to work with an artist and not only to see the beautiful outcome, but to see the process of, of discovery and of appreciation on the part of the artist, in my experience, is very meaningful for the scientists. In 2005, NASA and the European Space Agency launched a mission to explore the surface of Titan, one of Saturn's moons. And they found a world that was strikingly different from Earth's, but also incredibly familiar. We were like, wow, these worlds are all different. They're not like our moon at all. They're not dead. So we went back decades later with Cassini, which had radar, which had the Huygens lander built by the European Space Agency that actually landed on the surface of this moon with an atmosphere where there's rain of methane that creates erosion just like on Earth, except it's not water, it's methane. Three, two, one, zero. We have commenced. And one of the first aha moments of space exploration came from NASA's Apollo 8 mission. And the landers who had the camera um, 
his job was to just photograph the moon and all the craters. All of a sudden says, oh my God, look at that. How beautiful the earth is from. That picture is the living legacy of Apollo being above this very dead moon, looking at all of life as we know it right there. One of the things that this show points to is the fact that the Earth has a very powerful magnetic field, but powerful enough to protect the, the life on Earth from solar radiation and solar energetic particles. Also protecting our technosphere, the GPS satellites, the communication satellites, the Earth observing satellites that enable our civilization and enable us to learn and understand things about our own Earth. The filmmakers hope that the audience will walk away from this space show having a deeper understanding of our solar system. So this, this evolution of a planet in the case of the Earth involves life itself. As far as we know, no such thing on, on Mars. To say we're so lucky to be on Earth, well, Earth is lucky to have us too. It's, it's, a, it's a give and take. We weren't just placed here, we evolved here. And if you want to see the worlds beyond Earth, you can come right here to the Hayden Planetarium at the American Museum of Natural History. I'm Adam Miller for Simply Science. And that's our show. Our thanks to the American Museum of Natural History. And to learn about their exhibits and programs on the web, visit them at amnh.org. And of course, you can always find us at tv.cuny.edu and Facebook and YouTube. I'm Barry Mitchell. See you next time on Simply Science. Ba ba da 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 da